on uh, in response to the murder of George Floyd, but also the collective murder of many black people throughout the years and the collective failure of our governments, both nationally and locally, to really protect black lives. Um, and obviously, this is an important I issue to piece up. And we felt that it necessary that we take action, as we see a lot of communities around the country to do, to see what we can do to create policy change here in Portland. Uh, we're going to start by reading some names of Black people who were killed here in Portland due to police violence and take a moment of silence before moving into the uh, agenda and welcoming uh, elected officials. Names of people who have been killed by police violence here in Portland include Andre Gladden, Patrick Kimmins, Qantas Hayes, Kendra James, Alberta Tate, Keaton, Keaton Otis, Lloyd Tony, DeAndre Keller, and Aaron Campbell. We're gonna take about a 30 second moment of silence for those individuals and other people killed across the United States, including George Floyd. Um, we'll take it for 30 seconds. Thank you for that. Uh, again, want to welcome you to the meeting. Um, we'll do an introduction of members in just a moment, but we do have Mayor Wheeler here with us today. want to thank him for taking the time out of his schedule uh, to be here. And he wants to listen, but I also just do want to give him uh, an opportunity to share some remarks. Um, and we you know one of the things that, for those of you who are not familiar with PCEP, uh, PCEP it was born out of the settlement agreement between the city and the Portland Police Bureau in the United States Department of Justice out of um, excessive use of force with persons perceived to have or actually have uh, mental health Ill issues. Um, and so we are, we are grounded within that document. And one of the things that we're looking to do is to have piece of codified. And I know the mayor has signaled public a, a number of times uh, that he, that is his intention. And so that's just one of the things I want to let you all know uh, in pretext to him speaking today and just one of the things that we're looking forward to um, to seeing done over the next uh, few weeks or, or month, whatever it takes to get that done. But Mayor Wheeler, thanks for being here and I invite you to give uh, some remarks. I'll be brief. Uh, I, I do not want to take center stage here. It's my intention to, to listen and uh, not become a distraction to the conversation or not become the focus of the conversation. The, the movement here is to elevate voices that have historically been shut out from this important conversation. And I want to respect that. Uh, I do want to say I understand both the moment and the movement. And I hear and I understand the anguish and the pain and the frustration and the anger that is boiling to the surface. It's, it's nothing new. This is a reflection on, on decades of injustice and uh, systematic racism and white supremacy in our community. And I'm committed to doing what I can do in my capacity as mayor to help heap, heal the wounds that are out there and move us forward. This is obviously a transformational opportunity for our community. And I look to stand with you throughout. So thank you for having me here today. And I will I will be here for the next hour or so, uh, but I, I will not be distracting from what it is you're having. Uh, Lakiana, you, you have my commitment, by the way. Um, when I created with uh, others the model for PSAP, my intention was to create an independent body that would outlast the, uh, the settlement agreement. And that is a commitment I made, and I hope you understand and can see clearly now that that's a commitment that I not only made, it's one that I've lived up to and that I intend to keep. Thank you for having me here today. 
Appreciate it, Mayor. Um, and just for everybody else's transparency, we're going to be meeting with the mayor on Tuesday, the steering committee, to talk further about some of these issues um, and, and uh, do what we can to be, because PSEP is that bridge between the community and the police and to bring forward recommendations that will be coming out of tonight and uh, future conversations that we will be having. Um, we're going to, there's a question, is this meeting being recorded? Yes, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, I'm gonna ask all of our members to introduce themselves and uh, the committees that they sit on or chair. Uh, and I'll just go down the list that I have here. And if you can introduce yourself, Hi everyone, I'm Ann Campbell. I'm a PSEP member and I sit on the Behavioral Health um, Subcommittee. I want to um, hear all of you today and um, center on Black voices and I hope to be part of the, the change in our community. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Ann. Britt? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Britt. I am with the Youth Subcommittee um, and similar to Anne, this is about the community, hearing what you uh, have to share with us. We have a few draft proposals, but um, those are open to interpretation and we can make additions as we go along. Thanks for being here. Vadim. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Vadim Mazursky, uh, Secretary of PSEP and on the Steering Committee, Behavioral Health Subcommittee, as well as the uh, Settlement and Agreement uh, and Policy Subcommittee. Um, looking forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you for your time. Andrew? I'm Andrew Kalk. I'm the co-chair of the PSEP and the chair of the Settlement Agreement and Policy Subcommittee. It's great to see you all uh, here. Many of you for the second uh, special meeting uh, in, in a week. So thank you all for your commitment and for your constructive dialogue. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Elliot? Elliot Young, alternate co-chair. I'm on the steering committee as well as the race and equity subcommittee and I think as my other colleagues have mentioned um, what PSEP can be is the megaphone for the community to city leaders and so we hope to do that job tonight. Marcia. Good evening everyone my name is Marcia Perez and I'm the chair of the racial equity subcommittee. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all today. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, Taji. Hello everyone, Taji Chessman. I sit on the youth subcommittee and similar to my colleagues, I believe that you know this meeting is very important to get the insight of the committee members in this room today and beyond. I'm really excited to have her going here tonight and hopefully create some substantive change moving forward. Thank you. Okay, um, I believe that is, oh, Yolanda. Yolanda. Yolanda, what happened to me? Yep, Yolanda and Amy. My bad. Yeah. Amy, you can go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Amy Anderson and I chair the Behavioral Health Subcommittee. And I really welcome everyone here and I thank you all for coming. My name is Yolanda Salguero and I am on the youth, um, I'm a, on the youth subcommittee as a co-chair. And I just want to thank all of you for being here on a Sunday evening at five. Appreciate you adding that note. I'm gonna turn it back over to Ann real quick to read off our PSEP um, guidelines that we, our community agreements that we had set forth in the beginning of this committee, just to remind us as this is a challenging dialogue and there's over a hundred people on this call. So Ann, if you wanna read those out for us. Okay, these are our PSEP group values, trust, open-mindedness, Assume positive intent, listen with intent, safety to be brave and vulnerable, effective communication, multiple intelligences, different learning styles, don't take things personally, don't make assumptions, do your best, be impeccable to your word, feel comfortable clarifying things with questions, be free to call out bias, step up or step back up, wait, be mindful of your level of contribution, passion and compassion, 
compromise, comfort with ambiguity, integrity, perseverance, self-care and community care, talk to each other, not about each other, and we as a group take care of one another. Thank you for reading those, Anne. Uh, those are the agreements that we will be using tonight. Um, so what we're gonna open up to now is a community feedback session where for the next 40 or so minutes, we're going to, again, take ideas from community members about um, recommendations they would like to see for the Portland Police Bureau to change its practices. We started this last week, and later on in the meeting, we are going to vote on two sets of recommendations, one on general um, recommendations to the police bureau that we can then use when we go into meetings, um, like the one we're gonna have this week with the mayor. We're also planning on meeting with the police chief uh, and with uh, President Turnell of the Portland Police Association, which is the union um, uh, for the Portland Police Bureau. And so we wanna hear your recommendations on what you would like to see. I'm gonna start by just reading off what was discussed last week. Um, uh, and is kind of the basis for the document that we're gonna use tonight. And I would just also let PSAP members know that there's still also some conversation around how we want to frame those. So once we get to the recommendations, we can, uh, in the second half when we actually vote on them, we can kind of discuss how we want to package them. But from last Saturday or Sunday's listening session, some of the ideas that were brought up were um, in no particular order to accelerate the city's effort to launch a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, this was an idea that PSEP had came up with uh, about a year ago and was adopted by the Portland Police Bureau in their community engagement plan, uh, similar to the model that was used in South Africa after the apartheid to have a, um, a, 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 a series of meetings or events where the community could deal with the racialized history of Portland uh, and the Police Bureau specifically. Um, support cultural shift by issuing police requiring officers to intervene in adopting peer intervention training. Amend policy relating to non-vehicular foot pursuit. Uh, improve hiring practices and community policing by having police live in the community they, they serve. More police out of uniform, especially while in schools. Um, now that was from last week before the superintendent and the mayor both announced the removal of officers, uh, school resource officers from schools. Um, make it easier to get fired for misconduct. Mandate police to complete volunteer hours with organizations that serve communities of color. Body worn cameras and overcome the privacy concerns. Um, develop community accountability structures uh, if policing is reform understand historical and ongoing anti-blackness in Oregon. Fired officers cannot be hired by another department, eliminating inequity of police officer and citizen rights. It shouldn't be harder to arrest a murdering police officer than a, a protester. Requiring police officers to be residents of Portland, reducing funding with the aim of defunding the police department. Um, as a community, we need to focus on restorative justice and policing accountability. Portland Police Bureau needs to engage the black community in reforming the department, its practices and hiring. Property damage and items are more important than black lives. Who is going to protect black people from the police? That is a brief overview and context of what was discussed last week. Again, we're gonna take the next 20, excuse me, 40 minutes to hear again from community members. We are going to be voting on recommendations. And for those of you not familiar with PSEP, um, our recommendations have to be considered by the police bureau and the commissioner. So there's a lot of power as we're looking at how do we take what the, the energy that's generated in the streets and the protests and turn it into actual change. This is a, a golden opportunity to do that. So I'm gonna ask for community members, if you can use your raise hand, feature um, to let me know if you would like to speak and we'll get a speaking cue up on here. And if you're in on the phone and would like to speak, if you could please um, just say that you would like to speak and we'll, 
we'll get that dialogue going. So give everybody a moment to please use the raise your hand feature. We are gonna start with Renea. If you wanna unmute yourself, hopefully I pronounced your name right. Hello, uh, my name is Renee Perry. I'm a citizen of Clinket Haida Nation of Southeast Alaska. I'm the president of the local chapter of um, Alaska Native Sisterhood, which is a 107 year old indigenous civil rights organization. Um, indigenous sovereignty is tied to black liberation. So, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of our relatives are indigenous and black. Uh, we have to make sure that those indigenous voices are part of um, conversations. Um, I was, uh, last week I mediated um, a domestic violence situation with police um, and was able, you know, to turn the situation around. Um, there's a problem with language um, in those situations towards domestic violence um, victims. Um, and I did file a report with the Independent Police Review Board. Um, last year, we, uh, the state of Oregon passed uh, Senate Bill 2625A for missing and murdered indigenous women um, that um, requires law enforcement to work with tribes and indigenous communities to uh, record data appropriately and to work on cultural um, sensitivity uh, trainings. Um, you know, that should also apply to black communities. Um, and also, um, I, you know, I work as a, a native community advocate, but I also am a licensed massage therapist. And I've been doing that for 12 years. It took me nine months to get my certificate um, and every two years, I have to do continuing education uh, for to renew my license. I have more training to do my profession than police officers do. And so that is something that I would like to suggest that, that they need to have more training. Thank you very much. Yeah, and just to clarify the training, was there a specific uh, training that you were wanting to see? Well, it's my understanding that there's like maybe six to eight weeks or 10 weeks of training for police. I could be wrong about that. Um, but there needs to be more um, training around um, uh, community relations, um, anti, you know, uh, anti-discrimination, anti-racism, um, anti-black, you know, looking at bias um, a little bit longer. Um, I know that we have put uh, social work on to police officers, and so we need to rework some of that framework as well. Um, and so some of, um, yeah, I think it's just more, a lot more community relations. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay, um, Heavenly Help, I see you are up next. You have to put you in line to speak. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Heavenly Help, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to read a list of items that I'd like us to consider. Um, I would like us to, in addition to what we have already developed with PCEF, I'd like us to focus on the can't wait for eight. I'm um, immediately banned choke holds, neck holds, and strangle holds, require de escalation, require warning with enough time in the language ASL, et cetera, needed before firing, require exhausting all alternatives before and instead of force and before shooting, and develop the criteria by which those would be held. Fire if don't. Can you slow down just a little bit so people can keep up with you? And we're taking some notes too. They're really um, great suggestions. So you, can sure go, you can go to the eight, the numeral eight can't wait. Um, I don't want to waste other people's time, so I'm speeding through that because I want to get to my own personal uh, additions, but eight can't wait. Those are things you can implement within 24 hours, a uh, direct order by Ted Wheeler as police commissioner or mayor and as city commissioners, and it can be immediately put into emergency enactment. 
The other ones I'm talking about may take a little longer. But the eight can't wait. Immediately ban choke holds, neck holds, and strangle holds. Two, require de-escalation. Three, require warning with enough time in the language like ASL, et cetera, needed before firing. Four, require exhausting all alternatives before and instead of force and before shooting, and that would be according to criteria developed by the community. Five, fire if don't promptly obey, duty to intervene and report. That means they're unemployed and they cannot be employed again. Six, ban shooting at moving vehicles and fast speed chases. I'm going to amplify on that. Seven, require force continuum specifying what civilian actions trigger and result in what law enforcement actions. And eight, require full and correct and prompt comprehensive reporting and evidence, integrity, and security. Now, for the ones that I want to add that you're not going to find on other places, um, we need to also immediately ban um, restraints and pressure and blows to the throat, the eyes, the genitals, the kidneys, and the head. We need to immediately enact as emergency ordinance for immediate implementation and enforcement. We need um, an immediate emergency ordinance going to immediate effect that bans all use, transport, sale, or storage of electromagnetic weapons, radioactive weapons, flashbang weapons and grenades, usually fatal invisible pain ray, ADS or AIS weapons uh, that burn people from the inside, laser blinding devices such as PHSAR or the taser 12 gauge shotgun such as XREP. I can email this on more detail later. XREP long range wireless electrocution weapons, the LRAD 100 plus yard long range acoustical device or audio weapons, and brain damaging weapons by any, each and every person or robot through any employer, public or private, military or mercenary or nonprofit, any governmental body of any nation or agency or jurisdiction that's operating within city limits. The EMP weapons make cars, trucks, planes, trains, and ships unsafe and, and operable by stopping and overriding their electrical and computer systems so the cars cannot brake, steer, um, and cannot be operated safely, endangering the lives of everyone within range of the plane, truck, etc. They also make it impossible for the person to access the windows or if there are electronic control of the doors and they could die from overheating or from cold because of the t not having temperature control or exhaust. Um, and we must um, provide immediate care and, uh, and ongoing therapy for victims of LROD and other noise weapons that can cause dizziness, stumbling, um, seizures, or heart failure and brain damage. We need to provide um, complete end of that. We need to stop the use of chemical weapons. The 1997 Chemical Weapons Convention prohibits the use of riot control agents in warfare. NWLP and NIJ have long considered of calmatives for both military and law enforcement applications, such as dispersing a crowd, controlling a riot, or calming a non-compliant offender. The most well-known and widely used riot control agents are tear gas, CS, and chloroautophanine, CN, also known as MACE. They must be immediately outlawed. We must stop the use of screaming microwaves that pierce the skull and cause brain injuries, such as- I want to give you another 30 seconds just so we can make sure to get everybody else. You got another 30 seconds uh, if you'd like to continue. There. Okay, we're going to keep moving. We do appreciate those. I would ask if you can email that list. It seems that there was a lot of things on this. If you can email that to us, Claudia or Theo, can you drop your email in the, in the, um, in the chat, uh, chat box for those of you who do have specific lists? Um, I'm going to go next to Hyung. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and then we'll be followed by uh, Andrea. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hopefully I pronounced your name right. Sorry about that. Yes, no, that's good. Um, I was just trying to get, um, I just got connected with um, a researcher at PS2 who um, has produced an economic, um, detailed economic analysis to back up the um, Unite Oregon CCC and um, uh, PALF um, demands. And I just want to speak in favor of those, um, calling for $50 million in cuts, and especially highlighting some um, things that I think are really important right now, um, eliminating the um, tactical emergency response cert. Um, I had noticed at first that there was a, um, I was a member of the um, budget advisory committee for the PP, um, PPB, and I noticed that um, they were asking for not only additional overtime, um, you know, $13 million, over $13 million of overtime scheduled, um, budgeted, and then um, some additional overtime, what, that including additional overtime to um, police protests during a presidential election year. And then also um, I noticed that there was a seven additional FTE for CERT, which is our SWAT team um, added. And, um, you know, initially I thought that, you know, those should be cut. And now from what we've, what we've seen with what's happened um, in other cities, um, in Buffalo, um, in, um, New York City, here in Portland, um, and in um, Minneapolis, I think it's time to actually cut the entire CERT and tactical emergency response team. Um, I was just recently discovered that study that was just republished by the uh, Mercury and also the Stranger um, from, I think, I forget, maybe 2015, that basically said that, you know, militarized policing actually leads to more violence. When um, police show up dressed for war, it leads to actually harming, endangering their own safety and the safety of the public. And I think we've seen that from what's happened in Portland in the last couple nights, um, not only in Portland, but all over the country right now. It just actually um, leads to increased violence. So I want to really speak in favor of and just let you know that there's going to be a detailed economic um, evidence to back this up that we cut $50 million and especially not only the, um, you know, things that are listed, please read through that um, document carefully, but I really do want to underscore cutting cert. It is time to eliminate that. It is um, inimical to um, public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Hyung. It looks like there's a lot of support for that as well. Uh, we're going to go with Andrea next, and then followed by that, we'll go with um, May. Hi there. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Valderrama. I currently serve as Advocacy Director of the Coalition of Communities of Color. We are a coalition comprised of 19 different culturally specific organizations. I'm here to lift up um, the asks of two of our black led um, organizations, PALF and Unite Oregon, um, calling for a defunding of the um, PPB and specifically by 50 million. I also want to lift up and it's I think important for me to say um, that we absolutely lean on the wisdom and the advocacy of so many past generations that have been calling for police reform, calling for an end to the murder um, of our black lives, of our indigenous community members, of our people of color, and that all of the wisdom and um, necessary items that we're thinking through have already been discussed have already been talked about and experienced by our communities. Um, some of the additional asks um, that PALF and UNITE are lifting up is specifically around um, the cuts to the specialty units in transit police, GVRT, CERT, and we do appreciate the defunding and the um, dissolving of the SROs. Um, thank you, Mayor, for that. Um, we also are really con committed to a conversation of reinvesting these resources into community-led um, health and safety um, strategies, again, that are new but also have been already recommended um, by our various communities. And then the last thing that I'll say is the thing that I appreciate about these asks is that they're very intersectional. There is um, a need here to really look at 
complying with sanctuary from ICE, knowing that there's a very real concern for violence for our Latinx community members. There's a very real commitment to um, focus on um, other areas of violence towards community members. Um, and again, to focus on um, civilian oversight for the Portland police contract negotiations. Mm -hmm. Um, so as an organization, CCC will be um, organizing the rest of our uh, community partners and members on continuing to advocate for these asks. And we just want to continue to lift them up and to do what we can to work together um, to get some of this really critical um, work uh, moved forward. So thank you so much for the time and for the opportunity to lift up these voices. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate what you all are doing at uh, Coalition of Communities of Color. Um, for those of you who are just joining us or weren't here quite at the beginning, we're doing our community listening portion of this meeting. So if you would like to share your recommendations for the Portland Police Bureau uh, to change its policy and practices, please uh, use your hand raise feature. Um, if you're on the phone, um, if you can just say, hey, I'd like to speak and then we'll get you down. If piece of staff can just make sure to kind of monitor the chat if people are throwing recommendations and they're trying to catch some of them, but there's... There's a lot. So um, we're going to go with May next and then Isabel. Hey there. Um, when you were referring to May, were you referring to me? Yes. Yes. Oh, cool. Sorry. Okay. I get your phone name. No, it's all good. My name's Maeve. Um, I just want to first address uh, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, if you address, uh, if you hear the anguish that our movement is expressing, um, I think that you need to enact um, a at least 30 day ban on tear gas. Um, May 30th, a young woman who was 22 years old named Sarah Grossman was killed by tear gas. Um, a 22 year old asthmatic Jewish woman, uh, just like me, um, out on the streets uh, exercising her first amendment right was killed by tear gas. It also causes miscarriages and respiratory systems that last for months sometimes after a, a exposure. Um, another thing, I don't think that we should be using rubber bullets uh, because they can kill at close range if they're being misused, which they are. Um, not only that, I'd like to t uh, point out that last night legal observers and journalists were maced and arrested. Um, this should not be happening. Cops in full riot gear, gas unarmed protesters, um, because the Portland Police Bureau finds water bottles to be more of a threat. Um, than addressing the murder, systematic murder and brutalization of primarily black Portlanders. Um, the $246 million uh, funding, drafted funding has to be reallocated away from militarization and towards community-based treatment and social service-based public safety solutions. The current drafted budget for the Portland Police Bureau is $32 million higher than that of the Housing Bureau if we divested funding from um, the uh, Portland Police Bureau into the Housing Bureau, that would certainly help um, address need-based, desperation-based crimes, such as theft and um, other crimes of poverty. Um, we could certainly be doing more to help people who are poor in our, in our um, community by investing um, in social safety networks. Um, to avoid and address um, crimes of necessity. Thank you, Maeve. Really appreciate that. Um, the speaking order is Isabel, Patrick, Margaret, Laura, and then Dan. And if you have spoke, if you can just put your, make sure to, there's a raise your hand and there's also take your hand down. If you could please take your hand down just so I can keep that chat clear. Um, Again, this is the community listening session portion of this meeting. So if you would like to share your thoughts, um, please raise your hand or let us know if you're on the phone. Um, yeah, so Isabel, you are up. Sure. So um, I am not part of any organized group except um, Unitarian, uh, the First Unitarian Church of Portland which has been in this um, individuals and groups of us for a long time. And um, I, I, I have two, I, I haven't been in this for a while, so I don't know the details in the weeds, 
But there's two major things I want to um, strongly uh, propose, and that is that the protections in the police contract so that police are not accountable, so that it's cut to, it's very protective of police. I, I want that to just go away. I think police should be as accountable for their actions as the citizenry, no matter who the citizens are. And I know, Mayor Wheeler, that the last contract was settled early because they expected you to win and they didn't want to deal with you. And I don't know when the contract is up, but um, I am behind your hanging top on making it impossible for people who are in the police force who have done violence to just hide. Um, the second thing is that um, I think that in every case where there is police violence, that should not be investigated and then perhaps prosecuted by the local district attorney. It, as, as with um, the procedure in Minneapolis, the state attorney general was called in to supervise that investigation. I think that, and this is something I said to Senator Frederick in a meeting a couple of days ago too, that the state level, there should be legislation, nothing personal, it's not about who's the mayor of any city, who's the police chief. It's about people who work hand in glove at the local level, the, in our case, the county and the city, district attorney in the county needs the police department to do his or her job. It's so obvious this is not something that should be done by that district attorney. I think it should be done at the state level. There should be a separate office under the attorney general and those cases should be adjudicated by someone who's not depending on the police department for his or her bread and butter. Very simple. So I'm all behind those two. They're very big points. And I know when it's there and I know when it's not there. And I've been at lots of city hall meetings when Joanne Hardesty was sitting in the seat down the way from me. And I'm so glad that she's there as a voice for the black community and for all of us. The things that we were saying as individuals before you were actually mayor, Ted, I, I stopped going after a while. Um, the things that, that were being said, they still need to be really listened to and acted on. Minneapolis, <laughs> they're gonna defund their police department. They don't know how they're gonna do it. They just all voted on it. Wow, that's huge. I'm not suggesting that. But I have a friend who was stopped by police in front of his pace, place of employment, which was ART, because that police officer didn't think he should be sitting in his own car at night, even though he'd just been rehearsing a play. That should never happen. There's not black communities and white communities. And if you're a black person in a white community, you're suspicious. That should not happen. I'm never suspicious. Well, maybe I am now. <laughs> 30 seconds I, in, though. I'm done. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we have next up Patrick, then Margaret, Laura, Dan, Francesca, and then Jacqueline, if you want to speak, please put your hand up. We'll make sure that everybody gets a chance. Keep it roughly around two minutes. Um, great passion so far. Thank you, everybody who's shared. This is a PSAP special listening session. Uh, Patrick, 
Patrick's gone. Patrick, if you're here. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I lowered my hand because you said to lower your hand when it was time. Okay, I uh, want to bring up the fact that de-escalation amongst police officers is very important. And de-escalation only works when you have the trust of the person that you're trying to de-escalate. I, I made about $35,000 a year working for Sisters of the Road, but I had the, the trust of the community there where I could actually ask somebody, hey, it's really important that you don't wear that shirt that says something that's violent and, you, and can stress other people. It's really important to me that you hand me your knife and we put it in the drawer over here until you leave because it's a weapon that is, can cause violence. The po Portland police have to, be, have to be associated with our city in some fashion where we can expect them to, to uh, uh, have that community uh, relationship where a community member says, hey, I know that guy. He's somebody I, I can trust. And it, until we have that, and until we have a mass level of de-escalation training and community training with, with police officers, we're gonna to continue to have this problem over and over and over again. No matter how great our leadership is, no matter how, you know, how we hire people, how, how we train them, we have to train for de-escalation and we have to train for community outreach and community involvement in our police officers. Appreciate it. Appreciate that, Patrick. Uh, Margaret and Isabel and Hung, if you guys could please lower your hands if you've already spoke. Margaret, you're up. Okay, we're gonna go come back to you. We're gonna go to Laura. Sorry, I'm here. I didn't. Oh, okay. oh, cool. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, I'm Margaret. I've been a uh, student reporter at PSU for the last two years, covering uh, campus public health and safety issues. Um, our campus, PSU, is located downtown Portland, so the community of the university is very much overlapped with the community of the city. And through my reporting, um, have come to recognize how Portland police work hand in hand with the university police as well. Um, and based on my reporting, I think it's important for uh, Peace Up, the mayor, and PPB to consider uh, certain topics, um, such as uh, the use of body cameras. There is an example of, of body camera footage that shows how police officers uh, are brought on to de-escalate a case. Um, Portland police don't use body cameras. They considered a pilot program last summer, but it failed. Um, but Portland State University armed officers do have body cameras. There is an instance where you can see how their de-escalation techniques in tandem working together result. And I think there's enough evidence to show that that footage um, shows a man dying on camera. Uh, and that man is Richard Berry. So I think that's an a, a important case to look at. Um, the other, and if you consider how much surveillance is, of these past events has been coming from um, news helicopters and from people's cell phones, it begs the question, uh, what, what systems do we have in place to surveil the police and what happened with that body camera program? Um, the, another issue that um, I think nationally should, is one to have is who is writing police policies. Um, a huge company called Lexapol uh, is responsible for at least PPB's use of force policy that um, was in place before the 2012 settlement. Um, Lexapol is the biggest private company that provides policies to police departments across the country, but it has no oversight and it prioritizes policies that um, give a low liability model uh, to, save, to save money in litigation. So it doesn't prioritize best practices and they're not uh, forthcoming about how they incorporate best practices. And it's only been studied um, by the UCLA team um, in a 2016 paper. I think that's a, a, a very insightful paper. 
Um, and I, I don't know if PPB's policies are still written by Lexapol, but CPSO, PSU's armed forces use the policies like PPB's to make sure they are all connected. Um, so to look at the police complex as a culture, uh, it seems it seems like a good thing to look at the policies that they all share that, uh, again, prioritize low liability over best practices. Um, the last point I'd like to make is the uh, Bill 0620, um, the current bill that the city of Portland has proposed to limit arbitrator power when uh, it comes to police misconduct cases. And um, it does push the needle further in holding police accountable, yet it specifically says that bill would only apply if the arbitrator agrees that misconduct occurs. So I'd like, I think it uh, begs the question, is that enough? That's all I'd like to say, thank you. Great points, Margaret, really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna go next to Laura. Laura, you're still on mute. After Laura, we're going to hear from Dan, Francesca, Jacqueline. There you go, Laura. Nope, oh, you just went on mute again. There you go. I am a lifelong resident of Portland and um, an activist on the Portland Harbor Superfund site and also the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Um, I I feel just quickly, I'm, I'm sort of coming to this new and not in terms of what I've seen with the police in Portland. They've been great cause for concern for me in my life living in this city for a very long time. But I just want to throw in the idea basket, maybe in terms of truth and reconciliation, forming a citizen's tribunal where we get to, that's separate from the court system where we get to um, you know, look at these issues and um, in community um, to try to make better sense of them and to pass judgment when judgment needs to be passed on things that happen with the police. Um, this is a very, you know, nascent thought. I don't really know exactly how this could work, but I feel that we need a voice and we need to accuse when we need to accuse and then um, reconciliation is possible. And I really don't think that's happening here in my experience. So that's just a, that's just a little thought. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. And kind of goes in line with the truth and reconciliation uh, recommendation we had passed. Yeah. Um, okay, so Next on the list, I got Dan, then Francesca, Jacqueline, Jonah, and Soul. Um, we'll go with that. After that, if there's maybe one or two people after Soul, we'll, we'll take a couple more hands, and then we're going to have to move into the next part of our meeting. Okay. Hi. So, uh, hi. Go ahead. Uh, this is, all right. This is Dan Handelman. I'm with Portland Cop Watch. And uh, uh, earlier this evening, we sent to the PCCP and the media a fact sheet about that bill um, that um, was being talked about a minute ago about arbitration. And I, I'm going to paste the link to the our fact sheet in the chat. And people who don't know, there's a little thing that says chat at the bottom of your screen. You should pull that up. There's a lot of stuff going on in there and you can download it at the end. There's a whole bunch of links that you're gonna need later. Um, so the fact sheet that we wrote, uh, goes into much more detail about what was mentioned before, which is that this bill will only help if the police find the officer out of policy and the arbitrator agrees they were out of policy, then they can't lower the amount of discipline. We outlined six very high prominent cases, including several that include uh, that involved the death of uh, community members, some of whose names you read off before co-chair Drury. Um, where the officers were punished and the punishment was overturned because the arbitrator did not agree that there was misconduct. So the uh, bill is a nice bill. We're not opposed to the bill here at Portland Cop Watch, but it doesn't do what it, people are saying it's going to do. It does not fix the arbitration system. It's not going to keep fired cops fired, and it needs to be stronger. It needs to be fixed and changed. This is, bill is being fast-tracked right now, and I really hope that PCCP will help 
put forward a resolution tonight encouraging people to slow that bill down and insert stuff into it that will actually make it do what people think it's going to do. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And again, Dan, can, you, Dan, can you just tell me the name of that bill again? That's the 0620 yeah, bill. Um, it is SB 1567 in this uh, 2020 um, legis uh, Oregon legislature. There's a link to it at the bottom of our fact sheet um, where you can read the um, substance of it, but it's, it's about uh, fixing our police arbitration. I'll paste a link to it in the, in the chat as well. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so speaker list is uh, done with based off who I have on this list. So the last people that will be speaking are Francesca, Jacqueline, Jonah, Sol, Darcy, and Megan in that order. So Francesca, you're up. Hi, thank you. My name is Francesca. I'm a current graduate student at the PSU College of Urban and Public Affairs. Um, today I'm offering suggestions from the list for eight to abolition because I don't believe that the eight can't wait list goes far enough, especially as Portland has already achieved five of those. Um, I will drop this in the chat afterwards. Um, today I'm calling for the defunding of the police and the reallocation of those funds to community services. We need to follow the lead of Minneapolis. Mayor Wheeler, I'm asking that you reject any proposed expansion to police budgets. We demand the highest budget cuts possible per year. Cut police salaries across the board until they are zeroed out. Instead, allocate that city funding towards the following. Healthcare infrastructure, wellness resources, neighborhood-based trauma centers, non-coercive drug and alcohol treatment programming, peer support networks, and training for healthcare professionals. Finally, make these services available for free to low-income residents. Thank you. Francesca, really appreciate that. Sorry for the mispronunciation on your name earlier. Um, a lot of thumbs up from those comments, really appreciate them. Um, yeah, can you, can you, Francesca, can you um, message me your email or drop it in the chat so we can follow up on some of those ideas? Absolutely, Who's, thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, Jacqueline. Hi, um, I'm Jacqueline Bovee. I'm a teacher of English language development at Jefferson High School. And um, I first wanna thank Lafiana and PSAP. I know you've been doing this work for a really long time. I've been meaning to come to more meetings and um, am finding time in this weird COVID moment where meetings are online and also um, feel, you know, just compelled by this moment in history. And I imagine that many, many other people are as well. And so I know that you all have been doing this work for years, um, but I just really wanna highlight like, how huge this revolutionary moment is and encourage us to rethink some of the demands or suggestions that have previously been made by PSAP um, for reforms to the police because I think that more is possible right now than we've ever seen before. If you look at Minneapolis just today, right? Um, things that we didn't think were possible yesterday are suddenly becoming possible. Um, so I just encourage us to like both honor the work that's been done for a long time and shift the work and demand more. Um, so in light of that, um, I'm just here to uplift demands made by the community already um, that have been led by black and brown folks. Um, I was in, a, I listened in on a meeting earlier with Mayor Wheeler and Ms. Donna from Race Talks and Lilith Sinclair um, from activism actually, and I wanna uplift the demands that they made for, um, as other people have said, stopping the use of tear gas immediately. Um, and then the bigger, longer term demands around defunding the police of Health and Unite Oregon. Um, I think we just really should be looking at those and rethinking what we think is possible. Um, and I also want to thank Patrick, I think it was Patrick, um, for the work that you've done with Sisters of the Road and for speaking to the need for relationship building um, as a prerequisite to de-escalation work. As a teacher, I experience that every day. Um, I can't do 
my work with students without having built relationships based on trust. And I can't de-escalate a single situation unless I have trust built with those students. And um, the problem is that trust has never existed between police and black and brown communities, especially in immigrant communities. We know that police, the, the entire history of policing in this country is built on a racist system. And as many people have been pointing out in recent days is tied to history of slave catching. So the trust has never existed. Um, and instead of trying to create small reforms that build trust here and there and there, this is a moment to really think more revolutionarily and think um, about starting fresh and building trust from the ground up. Thanks. Great points. Great to see you, Jacqueline. Um, so Darcy and then uh, Megan are our last folks on the list. Oh, wait. I said Jonah, right? Yeah, go ahead, Jonah. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jonah. I'm a resident of Portland. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time because I think uh, everything that everybody's been saying is awesome to hear. Um, right now, as I understand, the Enhanced Crisis Intervention Teams are one of the more successful programs in uh, the Portland Police Bureau uh, because officers are self-selecting into a program that is working to make a difference. Um, so I recommend that we reduce the police force to the amount of officers who are willing to self-select into that program. Um, all officers should be interested in helping their community um, and receiving the best training possible. And if they're not self-selecting into that, then they are not interested in helping our community. Thank you, appreciate that, Jonah. Um, we have Sol, Darcy, and then Megan to close this piece out. Hi, my name is Sol Santivi. I'm part of the Malala and Wasco people, the indigenous people of Oregon. I work in youth corrections as a teacher. I also, as a volunteer um, in uh, the juvenile uh, detention and Oregon Youth Authority, as well as public school systems throughout Oregon and um, even in Arkansas. And so I uh, just want to say thank you for all of your guys' hard work and also to look to the organizations that have been working for decades in this as well as like trauma-informed care and um, cross-cultural communication. I see a lot of problems when it comes to culture as well kids getting uh, kicked out of programs just because the staff members don't understand like native culture or, or things like that. Trauma and for care practices for hospitals, corrections and education staff would be really good for that I see because I see a lot of people not understanding those kinds of things when they're talking to kids. Um, even the culture between poverty and privilege is the language is so different. Um, there's so many things. I hope there's like a place where we can talk later because I like to uh, get involved more with the people on this thread. Um, I'm my I'm kind of nervous, so uh, my mind's going blank. But like in uh, residential uh, facilities for mental health, I see that as a huge thing. Some of the kids in uh, prison right now are going for a very long time because they murdered their abuser. Um, that could have been prevented. They're not being listened to. Um, a lot of the kids in there are black, brown, and poor white. Um, that is saying something from, you know, going back to the uh, police on the streets all the way to the correctional system. And maybe we should talk about privatizing prisons in a later conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sol. I uh, appreciate that. There's a good quote that um, something to the effect of speak even if your voice shakes. So I appreciate you having the courage to do that. Um, we do have subcommittees that also meet. Um, and we'll get a chance at the end to hear from them about when their next meetings are and some upcoming tasks. But I think that's a, a great way to segment um, the larger conversation that's happening here into smaller actionable steps. 
Um, we have next on this list, Darcy and then Megan to close this section out. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm Darcy Kramer, and I wanted to very briefly represent the disability community. Um, I speak as a disabled person. Um, among my disabilities, I am very hard of hearing. Uh, if somebody yells at me and they're not facing me directly, I will not hear or understand what they're saying. And this has been a great fear of mine as the police become more and more militant and military in their actions because somebody could yell stop at me and I would keep going because I would not hear them. And this is one of those fundamental issues that nobody talks about, that the disability community may react very differently. Someone on the autism spectrum, for example, may react very, very differently than what is expected when someone in authority yells at them. So that is a, an important component that I think is, is missing in, in, it's sort of there, but it's also missing is, you know, we talk about training, but that training has to include communication and how to understand that not everyone is going to obey or cooperate when you yell at them um, or they may not hear or they may not comprehend they may have an auditory processing disorder um, you know the blind community is very very concerned about marching because police shove people and if you get shoved and you're blind and your cane rolls away from you you're sitting there and hopefully some of your fellow protesters will intervene and help but that's a very vulnerable place to be so i just wanted to toss that out thank you thank you darcy uh, a lot of comments in the section appreciating you raising that point um something that we don't always think about so we really appreciate that. Um, we are going to have our last speaker is Megan. Hi, I think that's me. I'm Megan and I'm a Portland resident and also my daytime job a professor at Portland State University where I teach on urban planning issues and try to center racial equity when possible. And I'm speaking tonight because Kyung Nam um, from PNPC asked me to, but I, I mainly want to just echo and uplift the other calls I've heard from other folks um about health and unite oregon's demands that uh the city defund the portland police bureau by at least minimum 50 million dollars immediately and more so in the future and notably that's only going to be about one-fifth of the 250 million dollars allocated in the 2020-21 budget toward to the police bureau and i want to just make a couple comments on on a budget a budget you know is a moral document and the city's morals need to change right now uh, in the last 10 years, the, the police department has been, the budget for the police department has gone up every year over inflation, while other bureaus like housing and parks and rec have almost every year faced systematic defunding. Um, meanwhile, the proposed budget has the bureau getting an increase even in the year when we have a 75 million shortfall expected in the general revenue due to COVID related impacts, which of course are disproportionately affecting low income and people of color residents in our communities. Um, so that's another reason. A couple comments um, uh, that about the budget to defund the police bureau by $50 million immediately uh, would take actually not filling the vacant positions that they're planned for in the budget. And that would take actually letting some officers go. And we're not asking for uh, Pulse and Unite Oregon are not asking for a movement of money around within the Portland Police Bureau. We're talking about defunding the Police Bureau, moving that money into housing and resources, particularly for communities that have been over-policed and underserved by the city in the past. And particular areas where that money could come from include um, transit police, the gun violence reduction team, um, the CERT, which of course is in the news a lot right now because they're violently in the streets uh, every night right now. Um, and divesting from the Portland cannabis tax, which should be money that all goes back into um, 
black and brown communities that were over policed around marijuana before it was made illegal or before it was legalized, I'm sorry. So there's pretty clear ways to achieve a $21 million saving immediately just by defunding those. And another place where uh, budget savings could be made is um, by strictly um, reducing overtime by police, which has been something that police have not been held accountable on for years in the police department. Um, and even the city's own budget analysis reveals that um, police police officers are taking advantage of overtime, and that's and and there's 13 million dollars set aside in the upcoming budget for overtime, um, and also by not violently um, coming out against peaceful demonstrators in the street. So I've got lots more to say about that, but I want to end by um, again using my voice to uplift health and unite Oregon's demand um, to defund the, the police and move that money into uh, into into places where our moral budget would be and into housing particularly. Um, because the number one call right now to police are people who are experiencing houselessness. So the problem we're facing as a community is houselessness. It's not crime, it's houselessness. Um, so let's invest in that. Um, yeah, thanks so much uh, for inviting me to speak to Nick Young and, and for letting me speak to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, before we close this section out, I do want to acknowledge that um, most of our speakers were white and in the last meeting we opened the meeting by allowing our black residents to speak first and so I would like to invite any black members who haven't spoken or would like to share something uh, to close out this section and if you could raise your hand or just unmute yourself and talk to close the section out. Hi this is Pastor Wiseman. Uh, what I would like to recommend, uh, some months back, uh, I got stopped. It was more like the federal stop where that they surrounded the car because of a call in of a uh, road rage. And to me, it was more like a suicide by police where that what they did. But um, because I have been through the uh, citizen training, Academy with the Portland Police. I've also been uh, part of the Albino Ministerial Alliance through all the shootings here in Portland. I had a little bit of awareness of the stop. Um, but when they asked me uh, to step out the vehicle, uh, my sugar, I'm diabetic, was down to about 60. So I was really in a confused state. But because of, uh, again, my understanding of what was going on as best as I could, I got out, followed the command, all the way to where the officer asked me to back up with my hands raised to ask me the question, uh, what was going on? The gentleman who called the police said I had a gun in the car, and I was stepping out the car in the city of Gresham, uh, waving it at people. Um, so I took his license plate number because I kind of felt that that was going to be the next stop. Um, but as the officers began to question me, uh, ask me what was going on, my very next reaction was to know that the call came through 911 through him. I wanted to know what the call was with him. What call did you receive? He told me again, a black man with a gun in the city of Gresham. I, kind of summarize that with him. Uh, after a period of time uh, of listening and talking with him, he recognized me. This was also uh, with the sheriff's department. Uh, when he did recognize me after I told him who I was and how I have been instrumental in the state and working with the city uh, and the bureau, um, he actually had everyone to lower their guns, which was about 15 officers waving them at me. Uh, me and the officer had a meeting. I contacted uh, Chief Reese and wanted to meet with him. And what I wanted to recommend is to the um, sheriff and to the training department, uh, when people are going through a medical emergency or medical stress, even though that they ask them to raise their hand, step out, turn around, walk toward me. I feel the next question that before any of that is to make sure that they ask them, are you able to understand any of my commands? Because uh, again, a lot of our shootings that has happened through Keith Notice as others, um, 
they were in medical crisis. And without them being able to understand uh, with all the commands that they're throwing at them, simply like what happened with Jahar Perez, um, they assume that they are a threat. So my recommendation is um, in the questioning, I'm trying to uh, get the person out the vehicle to follow their command, should they should ask them, are you in a medical crisis or can you understand every command that I've given you? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Weiss, for sharing that. Um, I will note that we PSEP passed what was we called a procedural justice recommendation that would ask, that would require officers to ask if there's any reasonable accommodation that they can make to individuals when they're having a stop, uh, in addition to also giving the reason for the stop. And the, P the Portland Police Bureau did pass that and it's gonna be going through a universal review process. So we'll follow up with that um, and put that as part of it. Um, again, we're just wrapping up the community listening session, but I do wanna give space to any black community members on the call if they have not shared uh, to share any final thoughts that they would like. Anybody? Okay, we are gonna move on. I'm gonna pass it over to Andrew. Um, this section's a little bit undefined. We are having some conversation as this was happening uh oh Mookie I did see you. okay I didn't know if you were on another call Mookie did was trying to talk just unmute yourself Mookie uh I saw you I thought maybe you were on another call go ahead hi my name is Mookie Azora um I've been a 10-year resident of Portland and I'm a currently a researcher at Intel and I think we reached an inflection point this is a transformative moment it's time to remake our whole notions of community safety. The police have been used to brutalize riots in the 60s to the LA. You're cutting out just in 92. To this moment today, we need to transform community policing, the notion of police. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, these ideas around defund the police really mean refund our communities, shifting the resources that we now use to bring a militarized presence into our communities, into resources that will help build up these communities and ensure safety for everyone, whether it's housing, whether it's mental health and public health services, whether it's education, whether it's housing, those services need to be invested in to ensure our communities are safe, including transforming the notion of a police department into a community safety division. How do we keep safety within our communities without having a militarized presence that terrorizes black people, that terrorizes black men, and sees them as threats and criminals that needs to be transformed? Portland will miss this moment unless you act now. This discussion needs to shift from simply reforming to transforming how we do community safety. Minnesota has acted. Minneapolis has acted. This community needs to act now. And that's my point. All right, appreciate it, Mookie. I'm glad that we were able to see your hand and get you in there. Um, anybody else? I saw a comment about Dustin. Maybe you wanted to say something? Nope, okay, you're good. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. As I was saying, there's a little bit of discussion we were trying to have to figure out what is gonna happen next, but I'm gonna trust his leadership that we'll figure this out, anything I can do to support. Um, appreciate everybody for speaking, appreciate Mayor for staying to the end of that section and um, hearing out all the community members. Thank you all for that. Thank you, Lakiana. Uh, Judith, I don't know if you're able to share your screen with the list of recommendations, some of which uh, Lakiana mentioned earlier. Um, just because I know it's easier for some folks to to read on a screen what we're talking about as opposed to just uh, using the audio. Here we go. Great. 
So um, the way we'll, we'll uh, uh, start this section is to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that have been uh, built out by PSET members over the last week. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple at the top here. This is perfect, Judith. Uh, and then I'm going to kick it to uh, our uh, our colleague, Elliot, uh, who has put together two additional recommendations that don't appear on your screen right now uh, that, that he would like to discuss and get feedback on. Uh, so just so just so it's clear, these, these three were mentioned earlier, but just wanted to highlight a few uh, additional pieces here. Um, the acceleration of truth and reconciliation. I appreciate the comments people have made about uh, things like a citizen's tribunal, uh, which very much is in line with the, the the T and R model. Um, when we proposed this last year, uh, we encouraged the not only the police bureau but the city to put together a working group on a truth and reconciliation commission with the goal of enacting uh, such a commission within three years. Uh, our idea at the time was actually that that was a reasonably aggressive goal given the complexity of the situation and the fact that truth and reconciliation models uh, require enormous community buy-in to actually be effective. Uh, but we think that uh, given everything that has happened since, uh, we need to accelerate that time frame. And you can see here uh, urging the city to launch the working group sometime this summer uh, so that the commission can start in earnest by next year. So that's, uh, that's that recommendation. The second one here uh, is about requiring officers to intervene in adopting peer intervention training. You might see on the uh, Can't Wait for Eight website that it actually has a check mark next to um, a duty to intervene. However, the duty to intervene in Portland is uh, limited to when officers see one another performing unlawful acts. Uh, and that, it's not necessarily the type of duty that we want um, uh, our police officers to adhere to. Uh, there are acts that may well be lawful, especially given uh, the, the, the sort of history of this arena, that are still deeply immoral and unjust and that we would expect uh, police officers to, to intervene with their colleagues on. And so we want the police bureau to, to review that directive, but also to look at peer intervention trainings that have been uh, achieved in places like New Orleans uh, and Los New Orleans in particular, and we can circulate a link to New Orleans training. The idea here is that uh, intervention is not just something you can throw a policy in there and expect people to abide by. I think we are all uh, uh, familiar in our own lives, far from the policing context, but in our own lives, of just how difficult it can be to speak up uh, when you see someone who you know well uh, doing something that maybe you don't think is, is cool. Uh, and this is something that doesn't just need to be put on paper. It needs to be really drilled into us as a matter of police culture. Uh, and so that's what this, this recommendation is about. Then the last one, just to give a little bit more context here, uh, the Police Bureau has policies related to use of force during vehicular pursuits and non-vehicular pursuits. In other words, when they're chasing a, a, a suspect on foot. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, uh, but uh, suffice to say, we, we think that, or at least I, I, I believe, and this is, this is one of the recommendations I put forward, um, that there should be no circumstance in which someone who is suspected um, of you know, passing something like a counterfeit $20 bill should ever be in a circumstance in which force is applied uh, in the way it was in George Floyd's uh, situation. Um, uh, it's simply the, 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 the so-called cost benefit, uh, using the police directive language, is nowhere near uh, right in that case. And so what we're asking here is for the police bureau to reopen those pursuit policies and make more explicit when the use of force is appropriate and when it is not. So that's, that's what uh, this third uh, bullet recommendation is here. Uh, at this point, and, and I'm, we're, I know this is a lot, but we're trying to sort of give you all the recommend many of the recommendations that we have developed and then seek your comment on them. So now uh, I'm going to kick it to, uh, to my friend and uh, co PSET member, uh, Elliot Young, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, two recommendations that, that he'd like feedback on tonight. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So um, I put in the chat the link to that recommendation 
And this comes out of work being done by the Portland People Elliot? Metro Coalition. Elliot? Yep. Um, can, yes. I just want to let Judith know, can somebody make the text bigger? There's comments in here that any text that's coming up, people can't see. So whoever's displaying it, can we just make sure that it's big enough for folks to read and then monitor the comments if they're seeing that it's still not big enough? Okay, so I think um, there's the, the text of this. What this does is it takes um, a lot of what people have mentioned today um, and puts it into the form of a recommendation. Essentially, this is a recommendation to, to redirect funds from the police to alternatives to policing. And I think I, for a long time, was thinking around the corners of reform. And like Mookie, I think this is a transformative moment. And I believe, especially given that the city council has a meeting coming up on Wednesday at the time, now is to act, the time now is for Peace Up to, to speak to this question. So what this does is talk about the fact that the budget has been increasing um, over the last um, couple of decades. It used to be 37% of the budget, now it's over 50% of the budget. And if Judith, if you could scroll down, at the same time since the 1980s, violent crime in Portland has been dramatically decre decreasing. Um, property, overall crime has been dramatically decreasing. So what we have is increasing police budgets, increasing share of the policing budget overall at the same time as we have declining crime. So there's definitely room to, um, to take money away from that. And part of this, as many people have mentioned, is because the police have been asked to take on functions that in the past they weren't um, asked to do, social functions that are more like social work. And so thinking about housing, thinking about the Portland Street response as a way to have unarmed people interact with homeless people, there's a, lot, a long list of alternatives to policing. It's too much to get into precisely here, but I think what this recommendation does is say that, um, we need to signal a defunding of police in, and a, or investment in alternatives to policing. Minneapolis City Council, I'll note um, tonight, has um, voted to do this. So this is happening in Minneapolis. It's happening around the country. And I think Portland and Peace Up should be on board with that. The second um, recommendation, um, if you could pull that up, Judith, is one which is more specific to this moment um, and urgent because people on our streets who are protesting, expressing their um, First Amendment rights are being gassed. They're being hit with acoustic devices, as people have um, talked about. And so what that proposal um, calls for is a ban on the use of chemical agents, a ban on the use of acous acoustic weapons, and a ban on um, flashbang grenades. Um, we know that these are indiscriminate weapons. The ACLU has come out against this. Medical health pro um, professionals across the state have come out against the use of these weapons because they're indiscriminate. And the time now is really um, for Peace Up to act and to, to um, voice what the community has been saying, not only in this session, but I think um, over the last uh, week or so, um, is that we urgently need to ban these. So I'll just leave it at that. You could, um, I'll put the other link up um, in the chat for the, uh, for the uh, banning of chemical weapons um, for people to look at the details. I'll leave it there. Great, thank you very much, Elliot. Um, at this point, um, uh, given, given the time, I, I would like to ask uh, non-PSET members for feedback. PSET members are going to have plenty of time to, to offer feedback, uh, additional time to offer feedback on these comments. But what we really want uh, is, is the community's input on, on this subset. We know there are a lot more ideas on there. We, as Lakiana said, we've been taking notes all night uh, and appreciate all the ideas that you have brought up. Uh, but if any of you have specific thoughts on any of the recommendations that were just uh, discussed, 
use the raise hand uh, function uh, and I will uh, call on folks as I see them. And we'll start with the pastor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just looking at the recommendations and thinking how great they are. Uh, because I remember back in the uh, early part of the 90s when uh, gang uh, violence was going down, uh, they were still using the same tactics, uh, continuing with what they were doing as far as uh, policing when there was no need to be so aggressive in those actions. Uh, I like what I see in that model, though, uh, and that's just a comment. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just like to offer my two cents for all the great work that's gone into this, if that's appropriate. Um, I'm really impressed by the recommendations. By way of background, I've been involved in city politics for about 25 years. I worked at City Hall for for 12 years, um, yeah, advising Commissioner Eric Sten. <clears throat> worked on a lot of public safety stuff. I've advised a bunch of candidates since then. I think this work is long overdue. Um, I'm very impressed by it, and I want to do whatever I can to help so that we seize the moment that we have in front of us now, including the budget vote on Wednesday. So just just let me know uh, how I can how I can help, and I'll be there. Thanks. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate that. Dustin, I see your hand raised. Yeah, uh, I just I agree. Uh, I love this these uh, policy ideas. I previously worked at a nonprofit where I worked directly with uh, youth, especially like youth of color. And there was always a situation where the need was great, but the funding was all always, uh, you know, not sufficient enough. So I think it sends a great message to our community. It sends a great message to our youth, especially by our black and brown uh, boys and girls. Uh, it's one thing to say we love and support you, but it's another thing to put policy behind it. Uh, so I, I do support these these measures and I support banning uh, tear gas as well. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you, Dustin. Young? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, this is a, just an incredible moment. There is amazing work being done all around the country. The People's Budget LA, um, there's work going on to really reimagine what our cities can do and rethink what public safety means. And um, we can be part of this uh, movement and really transform our society right now. This is a kind of a revolutionary moment. And I hope that Portland, as a progressive city, will really take up this opportunity in this historic moment. Thank you. Thank you. Megan. Um, hi. Um, I support what you've put forward. It's great. And I love the idea of us being a part of this energy right now to shift things dramatically. Um, I'm wondering about, is there anything around, for, <laughs> I support defunding. And while we still have officers on the street, is there something that we can pass about white supremacist officers, you know, officers that have known links to white supremacy, like we need to get them off the street immediately. <laughs> like, is there something to address hiring and firing of, uh, of people who, who have just known, um, I don't know how to say it really well here, but uh, I'm just, that's what I'm putting forward. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And obviously incredibly important. Um, uh, this, this issue did come up when we had uh, public town halls on the Portland Police contract, uh, specifically hiring and firing for a variety of conduct, including uh, racist uh, comments or actions, whether or not the officer was in uniform at the time. 
uh, I believe, although I'd have to go back uh, to the recommendations that we made at the time, that, that we made very clear that we wanted to see in the contract language that allowed for the termination of officers who, you know, who made such statements or who, who engaged in such conduct. Um, I, I, it's, it's interesting to sort of think about how to prevent those people from be, being hired in the first place and sort of how, 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 how that would work uh, from an HR context, but I think it's absolutely uh, uh, a, a, a great uh, idea and one that we can, we can think about further as we, as we discuss these policy ideas. May I ask a question? Sure. Of um, with with respect to like uh, background checks, obviously to speak to what Megan just said, we often find out, like in the case of the officer who uh, who killed George Floyd, we found out that he had you know these eighteen cases. I don't understand how this works from a policing standpoint, but is are there background checks? Is that public record, or uh, yeah. how does it work out? Yeah, no, this is an important an important question, and it's something that's being discussed uh, not only here but but nationwide. So uh, a few things on this: in many states, um, officer disciplinary records are uh, sealed; they're very difficult to get a hand on. Uh, and of course, even before that, there's a difference between a complaint that someone gives about an officer and that complaint actually leading to discipline or leading to a finding of of guilt in one way or another. And so it's even more difficult sometimes to get a hold of complaints. Uh, however, sort of two things on this. One, tomorrow, uh, the United States Senate, including uh, uh, Senator Merkley, uh, is expected to introduce a package of reforms, including a national database of police who have been terminated for misconduct. Right now, we see time and time again uh, that even when an officer is terminated for misconduct from a particular law enforcement post, he then often gets uh, hired again in another location that may or may not know of the reason for his termination. This happened uh, sort of most, most tragically, although there's not, there's not no one case, uh, in, the, in the case of, of Tamir Ice's death, uh, the officer there had, had used excessive force in the past uh, in another police department. Uh, so this is, a, this is a really serious issue. We've heard a couple of times from people on these calls that they would like to see more data, more statistics about uh, complaints uh, filed against Portland Police Bureau members. And I think that that's a really sort of interesting idea uh, that, that we, have, we have taken notes on tonight even, and we'll try to sort of develop what that would look like in practice. Because uh, I do think that uh, if we use data in every other aspect of our lives, certainly we should be able to sort of identify high risk situations, hopefully, and, and nip them in the bud. So thank, thank you for that question and the thought. Any other community comments on, on the recommendations we put forth? Otherwise, I'm going to ask the PSEP for their, for their input uh, in a moment. Can you hear me? Heavenly help. Uh, I, I want to make sure that anytime anyone is using the riot gear items, whether they're federal, state, county, mercenary, private, or public, that each item is clearly identified with Velcro or hook loop, um, with white reflective numerals uh, for their ID number and or um, letters for their names, top of their helmet, front of their visor, three inches in front of their chest, three inches um, back, uh, two inches on their upper arm, one inch on their elbow, one inch above their knee, one inch behind their knee and the thigh, uh, half inch outside their ankle boot or gaiter, uh, four inches down from the end of the muzzle, um, four inches down from the end of the baton at the top of the shield. So from the top, bottom, back or side, or if all we see is the weapon, and not the person, we will know who it is. And if they're not properly identified, that um, no one can be arrested or punished for disobedience or interference or anything like that because they are committing a felony of impersonating a police officer. If by holding them accountable, they're less likely to commit those crimes and we're less likely to waste a lot of money on them. Thank you, Heavenly Help. 
Uh, I see Margaret, your hand is raised, and then uh, Amy. We can't hear you, Margaret. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, I want. I had a question. If the current policy, um, ha if it is legal for them to use a restraint that has a knee on the neck. For there have been recent videos of the in the demonstrations um, that show that restraint, alarming restraint technique in use. Yeah, um, it is not it is not explicitly outlawed by Portland Police Bureau policy. So this is one of the this is one of the can't wait for eight, uh, uh, um, and and it's it's one of the ones that we have not we are we are not in in compliance with, so to speak. Uh, Ms. Davidson? Hey there, yeah. Um, so my name is Amy Davidson. I'm the um, Crime Survivor Program Director with Partnership for Safety and Justice. And I just wanted to offer um, to the conversation that um, I feel great about a lot of the suggestions that I'm hearing, um, specifically with respect to shifting funds or redirecting funds into community-based uh, alternatives to things, but I would be happier if I was hearing them um, in terms of being culturally specific. Um, and I think I'll just leave it at that. Do you mind saying a little bit more about what you mean, Amy? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine that most of the folks on this meeting have a sense that um, for folks, and it's actually been alluded to in some of the suggestions too, that uh, uh, to anybody who's attempting to address a dispute or anything of that sort, like when that comes from within the community where that exists, um, with people who already have those relationships, um, whether you're talking cops or whether you're talking community-based alternatives, um, that just, that prevents escalation in the first place. Uh, you have a sense of credibility that uh, you would not have otherwise to an outsider that comes into the community. But when it's like culturally specific, I mean, you are not only like figuratively, but also like literally speaking that person's language. You just have a sense of credibility. Whereas also we know that um, black indigenous and people of color do not report harm at the same rates as other groups. Um, because these relationships are uh, so fragmented and they've been so harmed. So I think any group that would be charged with addressing these harms um, would need to come from within the communities uh, themselves who are experiencing um, the most harm and the least help. I'm not sure if that helps answer the question or not. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah, sure. Any additional community comment? Okay, thank you. Um, as, as many of you know, we have uh, monthly uh, full board PSET mem uh, meetings on the fourth Tuesday of every month. That's, that's June 23rd, two weeks from this coming Tuesday, uh, when many of these uh, ideas that we discussed tonight, in addition to many of the you know the ideas that you have brought up uh, uh, will be discussed again and and come up for a vote. I do understand, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Elliot, that you think one of the one of yours in particular is so time sensitive uh, that that it should be voted on tonight. We didn't notice that we didn't we didn't have a link to it in the agenda or anything. But if you want to sort of make the case uh, for voting tonight, I, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So um, I understand we're moving faster than we normally do. And usually our proposals are vetted over several months. And I would just listening to what people said today in this meeting, what people said last week, what I hear the community saying is they want PSEP not only to listen, but to act. And the two recommendations which I came up with out of the community, really the community developed, I just synthesized them, I think, are things, both of which now I believe need to be acted on because the um, funding issue, the defunding the police, is something that will be voted on on Wednesday. 
the, the budget will be approved after Wednesday. So if we pass the resolution or recommendation on the 23rd, um, that could be useful for next year, but it will not be useful for the immediate, um, immediate budget that we're talking about now. And I think our community is asking for us to act now on that specific issue. On the other one about the use of chemical agents, every night or almost every night on the streets of Portland, this is something that people who are protesting are, some people who are protesting are experiencing. So I also think that that one um, deserves our attention right now. If we wanna be part of the conversation and channel those community uh, concerns to our elected leaders, the time to do it is, is right now. So that would be my pitch for voting tonight on those two. Thanks, Elliot. Uh want to give PSEP members the opportunity to, to weigh in on this uh, because again, as Elliot noted, this is, this is, this is not our typical uh, sort of notice and, and approval process, but uh, recognize that people may feel differently. Lakiana, I see your hand raised and then Vadim. You're muted, Lakiana. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah. Just echo Elliot's um, sentiments. I think uh, these numerous people have said these are very extraordinary times we have an opportunity to move forward and make radical change I think that we could see throughout the last week and just the history of policing in general that we are ready for radical change and so I would move to um, vote on both of these um, recommendations and I would also say that I think that PSEP should be meeting every Sunday um, I don't see us moving back to a model at this point where we were, we would go to just monthly meetings, seeing how much things are changing week by week. I think for PSEP to stay abreast with what's going on, um, that we should vote uh, today on both those recommendations, especially considering they're going to be doing budget work on Wednesday. So anything after that will be a mute point. Thank you. Vadim? Yes, um, I think that there's a reason why we have uh, meetings where we not only take input from the community, but also uh, have a time to deliberate some of these recommendations. I think it's very important that we make recommendations um, that uh, balance not only uh, community input and consider all that, but also have time to actually look into what those recommendations mean. Um, and I just haven't had time for that. Um, our mission statement says that we're supposed to not only exchange information between the community, but also Portland Police Bureau. I think we need time to actually hear back from Portland Police Bureau as to what their tactics are, what the money will be used for, um, when they've used these tactics in the past. I don't think we have enough information about that. Um, with respect to the point on um, the city council voting on the budget at this point in time, I mean, the budget's been you know deliberated over quite some time, and a lot of the increases in um, the budget relate to actual salaries of people having to pay rent for things um, and and costs that are fixed and so uh, with respect to the budget I, I don't even know what it entails at this point and so to vote on it without knowing what the budget actually means is um, something that I'm not sure I can do at this point in time I'd like to hear exactly where the money is going to um, I want to know what the fixed costs are um, what the reductions would mean. Are, 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 we, are we recommending that police officers be fired or city staff be fired if police officers are not fired due to their contracts? I mean, these are people's lives that we're kind of making recommendations on um, and, and we haven't had, you know, even a day to really think about this. And um, with respect to the uh, uh, public dispersal uh, recommendation, uh, I. I was just reading through some things that the other cities have been doing. So in Denver, as some of you may know, the uh, court over there, the federal court ruled that um, there should be restrictions on use of uh, some of these uh, tear gas and non-lethal devices. Uh, but it did carve out a recommendation with respect to uh, supervisors being able to authorize that. So police can't use these uh, devices on their own. But if a supervisor feels that um, it's needed for a response to specific acts of violence or destruction of property that it should still be allowed. Um, and um, in fact, that uh, an on-the-scene supervisor can make that decision. 
So if a federal court in Denver feels that these devices are allowed in, under some circumstances, such as if there's violence or destruction of property, um, perhaps it's a wiser alternative to restrict or to recommend that the Portland Police Bureau should be restricted in using that um, on their own. But if a supervisor or a lieutenant or a captain is present there and someone could be hurt or property damaged, I, you know, we've heard of riots and so on and breaking into stores. Um, I, I don't know all the facts here and it seems like it'd be a, um, a wise thing to get input from the police bureau as our mission st statement dictates uh, rather than uh, agreeing to recommendation, which I mean, we just barely have time to read. Thank you, Vadim. Tashi okay. and then Tashi and then Ann. Yeah, um, a simple fact, it took eight minutes and 46 seconds for them to make the decision to kill George Floyd. So I don't think we need to be sitting here and waiting a month or 20 more days to decide on acting on something that we obviously, from a wholeheartedly across the country, are agreeing unequivocally that this needs to be acted on now. Uh, tear gas has been proven in many instances to cause extreme harm and even fatal death. And so we have to look at that, which has been something that's been discussed since the 1960s. In addition to that, they already passed something where you have to use extreme discretion around um, tear gas, but who's it's still at the discretion of officers, whether it's the officer who's standing in front of the gate or it's the supervisor, it's still an officer. So people will die and people will get hurt and people will deal with something in a pandemic oh, that it directly affects respiratory systems. I just don't think it's the time for us to, you know, use bureaucratic tactics around something that obviously young people are leading and young people are fed up with the way that, you know, you are discussing how we should do this. And I mean, we have too often stuck to the ways things have been in this world and in this country specifically. It is time to have change. Whether or not we have all the details on these two recommendations, they are moving steps forward for us and they are giving us the opportunity to work with the city, to work with the Bureau in a way to move away from the way it's worked because our current system is not working for anyone, it's especially not working for black communities, which I do not think you have the right to be speaking for. Thank you. Anne, and then Marcia, uh, and then uh, we'll see if there are any more PSEP comments. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I agree that the time is now. I have really appreciated being a part of these listening sessions and hearing the voices of our community members. And I do appreciate process, but I believe that now we are in a, a moment, and I think that uh, in regards to the tear gas, that is never okay to be using. Um, and I think we all know that there's been enough information on that. I wanted to also say that I agree with Taji in terms of um, in reading about their, their thinking process behind using that um, tear gas, it is to their discretion. Um, so I'm, I'm troubled by that. So I vote to um, vote on those tonight. Thank you. Marcia? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what others are saying. I think there's no time like the present. Um, I can understand that folks might be impacted if you're employed by the city, um, but black and brown folks are disparately uh, affected by decisions that are made on a daily basis, and their voices are very rarely um, considered when we make policies. And as, as piece up, our role is to um, engage the community and bring their voice to the mayor and to the chief of police. Um, in the last two listening sessions, we've heard um, expressively by the community um, that the time is now. Uh, and so I don't think that it's our role necessarily to get into all the, the logistics of budgets. We're not budget people, but we, we can bring the voices of the community to where they need to get to. And the community is saying now. Um, and so I uh, would like to support Elliot uh, his recommendations. I think he did a great job and, and from looking at the comments and hearing what folks are saying, um, the community is, not, I haven't seen anybody be really opposed to moving forward. We also um, heard from others that are referencing 
um, like the uh, Urban League, Unite Oregon, Coalition for Communities of Color are talking about these recommendations and have been fighting for their voices to be heard. So I'd like to uplift what has already been talking about, been talked about, and um, this is in the time is now. So I, I support moving forward. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, seeing no other piece of comment at the moment, uh, I, I want to turn it over to Mr. Barber, who uh, has some things to say, I think, I believe. Um, thank you for time to speak. Um, I want to reiterate as a black male citizen in this city, please do not wait on anything to get this vote going. I think that is a disrespectful pr uh, process um, to all the black men who are sitting in these places uh, day after day struggling under threats. Just this week, a neighbor where I live sent a letter to my home saying they are going to call the police. A threat on my family this week after all that is going on around this country. Please do not slow anything down. We are tired of all of that political rhetoric. I do not mean to be disrespectful in this meeting, but I cannot, I cannot see how anyone would talk about slowing down anything right now, given where we are. When a black community has um, struggled through COVID, struggled through seeing our people um, committed, and then a white family has the audacity this week to threaten my family. We need to move now. I don't care that a police officer is going to have to figure out his life after we vote. People are dying and being threatened on the streets every single day. I cannot I cannot stress enough that we need to act now, we need to act swiftly, and we need to let a community know that we are moving in the right direction towards equity and uh, cherishing the humanity of all people, especially the black community here. Thank you for your time to speak. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm deeply sorry that that's happened. Uh, it, it, this week more than any other time perhaps but uh uh we we appreciate your passion i do want to say that uh you know one of our piece of values we laid out at the beginning is assuming positive intent and and uh my my friend and colleague vadim uh i, I know because he's worked on these policies for a long time uh is uh is is not raising concern uh for the sake of raising concern he wants to make sure that the policy is the right one and he wants to make sure that there's time uh, so that it actually works the way we want it to. Uh, and of course, we can disagree. Reasonable people can disagree about uh, you know whether whether that's fair or not. I actually uh, tend to come down on on his side uh, and think that we we it, we would benefit at least uh, from having more time. But I also understand the urgency that the people have expressed, and it's clear uh, at least from uh, the PSET member comment here uh, that. Uh, there is uh, a quorum to vote uh, on these recommendations. Uh, and so I'm not going to hold that up. Um, but given that we are at time, I do want to invite PSET members to vote yay or nay, uh, but also give any other uh, feedback uh, uh, that they may want to give in explaining their vote. A lot of times we just sort of go through this quickly. We haven't really had a lot of time at all to, to sort of dissect these two recommendations. Um, so I do want to uh, invite PSAP members uh, to do that as we, as we vote on these two uh, recommendations. Can I ask one clarifying question? The tear gas one is very clear, but what is the explicit language, either Elliot or Andrew, uh, from the uh, first recommendation about defunding the police? Elliot, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a good it's a good point. I, I think that rather than get into is it ten million, twenty million, fifty million, um, which you know Vadim raises questions about. You know, do we have the information to do that? I think at this point, what we could do, and I actually, listening to the community, want to make an amendment to to make a call to 
defund the police and refund our communities. And I think that that general statement then will have to be worked out what that exactly means um, about whether we're not filling vacancies, whether the GVRT is disbanded, et cetera. Um, I think that's a conversation which will continue to, to happen. But, um, but I think that what this is is a general statement saying the PSEP believes we need to move in this direction. And so the amendment that I want to offer to my own proposal based on what the community has said is in the second paragraph of the redirecting resources to change what it says, because several people um, raised some concerns about it, to, to change that first sentence to say, PSEP recommends that the city defund the police and refund our communities, period. Then to continue with, we furthermore ask that the city develop culturally specific alternative services um, and then continue with that can address the needs of the homeless and those suffering from mental health crises and drug and alcohol addiction. I think that there's probably, if we spent a month working on this, we could, you know, craft a lot of um, detailed language and make it much better. But I think that um, that will address the community concerns. And I think we should move forward with this um, as a general philosophical statement of where we stand now. Okay, we, we uh, understanding that uh, modification, we will, uh, we will move to a vote on this. Uh, Judith, I don't know if you have the ability to share your screen again and put up the recommendation that we're current, that's currently on the table. This is t the one titled redirecting funds from police to alternatives. Uh, again, I think it's just useful for folks to know exactly what we are, what we're voting on. And if you go to this, this second paragraph that starts with PSEP recommends, um, that's the paragraph that Elliot was just referring to in terms of uh, his, his friendly amendment to his own uh, recommendation. Uh, and so this is what we're going to vote on right now. I'm going to just uh, run down the list. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, we have, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we need five to pass. Is that what you see? Uh, six, I believe. Six to pass. Is that right? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll go down the list. Uh, we'll start with you, Anne. Uh, I vote yes. And I've already spoken, so I'll, I'm yep. going to... Thank you. Uh, Amy. Yeah, I definitely like the way this is going, so you have my vote. Sure. Yes. Uh, Yolanda. Yes. Britt? Yes. Taji? Yes. Marcia? Yes. Lakiana? Yes, and I would just add a, a clarifying point for those who are listening. When we say defund the police, what Minneapolis did, they, nine of the 13 city council members or whatever their statements are voted to, or they didn't vote, they pledged to defund the police and rebuild it from the ground up. So for those who are have less familiarity with it, uh, it does not mean that the police will disappear tomorrow or that, you know, um, there'll be a process to it. But long story short, I vote yes. Okay, I, I, I vote no. Um, I actually preferred the initial language about focusing the PPB on violent crime, reducing the scope of when PPB responds to complaints. Uh, but I am concerned about uh, the defunding language for some of the reasons that Vadim already raised. Uh, and uh, again, if we had more time, we would, we would probably be able to work through those, but I vote no as, as it stands. Uh, Vadim. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. I, I'm not against the spirit of any of these motions, uh, recommendations. I, I do think, though, that in order for them to be successful, and I think it's important that our recommendations are successful and that we don't make recommendations that are turned down because that'll just make us look and make the public look and make all the comments that everybody has given look as if uh, people aren't paying attention to it. So for them to succeed, 
I'd like to have time to uh, craft the language where we actually point out what needs to be cut, what needs to be addressed, and also for the use of dispersal devices, if there is violence going on and the police can't do anything else, um, I, I think there are certain circumstances where they might need to be used and uh, I, I wouldn't mind restricting them more, but there are circumstances in which they need to protect other people's lives uh, and I'd like to take time to actually discuss that. So maybe at some point in time we can revisit this, but for the time being, um, I don't know. And Vadim, just so I'm clear, that's no on the defund? Uh, no for both. Okay. Okay, uh, I believe Point of I clarification, got... no, we were, we were just voting on yes, the defund. Yes, we were, we were just voting on the defund, correct. Uh, and I believe I got everybody now, did I? Um... I, I didn't vote, but yes, I vote yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, that, uh, that passes. Uh, th and again, that was, that was the one that's on your screen now about uh, defunding, um, uh, the, the, the Bureau. We're now going to vote on the second recommendation. This is about uh, the use of tear gas and if we can bring that up on the screen just so we can see again what the what the language is. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'll read it and if we can get it on the screen, uh, great. Uh, but uh, it reads in, in relevant part, uh, given the widespread use of chemical weapons, aerial distraction devices known as flashbang grenades and long range acoustic devices, LRAD on demonstrators in Portland and the way these weapons indiscriminately harm large groups of peaceful demonstrators, we call for a ban on using these devices. So that's that's the, the broad call here. That's what we will be voting on now. And I'm just going to run down the list again. Anne? Yes. Amy? Sure. Why not? Yolanda? Yes. Britt? Yes. Taji? Yes. Marcia? Yes. Lakiana. In solidarity with everybody that's marching downtown right now, absolutely. Elliot. Yes. Uh, and I, I vote no on this. Um, again, I, I think that significantly limiting the use of, of these uh, devices is the right thing to do, but I, I do worry, uh, and Vadim already mentioned this, uh, about what we expect police to do in a circumstance in which other people's lives uh, are threatened. Uh, we need to hold police to an extremely high standard, uh, and uh, but what we also need to recognize the, the scenarios that police are confronted with. Uh, um, and it might not be in these protests, but it might be in another circumstance. So that is my vote, no. But that vote, my vote, no, uh, doesn't change the outcome in this case. Uh, it passes as well. So um, each of these has passed tonight. Um, we will have additional recommendations up for a vote, including the other three that we discussed in depth, as well as quite likely several of those uh, that, have, that have come uh, from all of you over the last couple of weeks at our full board meeting on June 23rd. So uh, the agenda for that is still uh, being developed, but uh, we already have that calendared. Uh, before we conclude, I just wanna, and I know we're over time, but I wanna give each of the subcommittees an opportunity to tell everyone on the call <laughs> when your next meeting is uh, and invite folks to attend. So Amy, I don't know if you uh, want to share the information for behavioral health. Well, I'm not sure we have it yet, given the next meeting is scheduled for July 5th, which is the day after the 4th. So it may not be a good time. We may have to move it. So we're going to have to talk about that as steering committee. So I'm not prepared to give you a date tonight. Okay. okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, Britt, Taji, Yolanda, you want to speak to youth? Yeah, um, our youth subcommittee meeting will be on June 8th, which is tomorrow. Uh, it's at 4 p.m. 
and we'll be discussing in depth our restorative justice recommendation, which touches on a few of the things um, Pastor Wisner mentioned earlier and some other folks. And so really excited to be working on that since the beginning of May, I believe. And we'll be having a forum on it on June 11th at five as well, which I think both of those things should be posted on the PSEPS website. Um, but yeah, come if you want to give more input. And thank you. Thank you. Marcia? Yes, the racial equity uh, subcommittee meets on the third Thursday of every month. So the next one is going to be hosted um, on Thursday at 5.30. And um, I'm hoping to cover some of the questions that actually came up tonight and really maybe talk about what a community accountability model means um, and what folks have uh, for thoughts in relation to um, the funding that wouldn't go to police necessarily, but still exists in the city um to figure out how where would we uh, put those funds to make sure that uh the needs of the community can be met so i hope you can join us i'll put it in the chat can i just add on to there it's not really about that but i just want to sneak in the can we get sunday as a reoccurring meeting until for the time being um unless it directly leads up right to the sunday before the steering committee meeting which even then might be still necessary i think uh, we don't have everybody on the call from the committee, so I want to make sure everybody on the committee has an opportunity to to weigh in on that. So we can we, we'll we'll figure it out quickly, uh, and then let everybody know um, because we've certainly appreciated folks taking the time today. Um, uh, steering committee steering committee is on Tuesday night. Uh, it, it, it's at five thirty. You can find the details on our website. Uh, we'll be discussing. Uh, a number of different issues, but particularly the agenda for the full board meeting. Uh, and then lastly, settlement agreement and policy subcommittee is on Wednesday afternoon at 4.30. Um, uh, that is also available on our website information uh, about that uh, uh, subcommittee meeting. So thank you. Uh, Lockheed, you want to uh, add anything before we close? No. I want to thank everybody for the meeting. Uh, extremely great work, um, tough times, and appreciate all the community members that have stayed on to the very end and really appreciate that feedback. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. We appreciate it. Peace. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for Bye. being here. <laughs>